Oh, you write about um, inclination and intuition in the book. I'd love for you to, in your words, just kind of describe the similarities and probably more importantly, the differences for those who are reading the book and trying to get to a mindset shift about time. Yeah, I think people often think uh, kind of inclinations and intuition, they just kind of lump them together maybe. Uh, I think a lot of the times our, our intuition is usually more something we maybe feel or know without necessarily knowing why. So, you know, a lot of people have almost like a sixth sense. They walk into a gathering, they feel something's off, and, you know, then they see, you know, an X of theirs is there. And so it's sort of like this intuition that, like, they feel something they can't really explain sometimes. Whereas inclinations are kind of our natural bend, um, how we're born, um, things we've done in our lives that have developed certain things. And so, um, so for example, I tend to have a natural inclination towards organizing people. Like when I was five, I had a lemonade stand and I hired the whole neighborhood so I didn't have to work. Like they're <laughs> running the stand and I'm like just kind of just making sure stuff's going, but they're doing the sales. And by the time I paid everyone, I made like no money. So I learned an important lesson about outsourcing there. Um, but. <laughs> But I think that, so there's certain bends we have. And, and so often as what we think though is that an inclination is permanent. That in the same way I have brown eyes that like I can't change that, you know. But an inclination, actually we can develop that. We can grow it. We're, we're always going to have our natural bend, but we can grow it in a number of different ways. Um, and there were three that I really discovered in the book that research shows that top performers have. And that's why we kind of start with that as the internal inclinations, uh, that area that we need to work on first before we get into kind of those later skills. And those three are um, curiosity, uh, an outsider perspective, and the ability to move on it. And so the first one, curiosity, we dug into quite a bit, uh, but just that idea of moving away from, I need a eureka moment or a light bulb moment where everything comes together um, and more of a posture that's saying, well, that's interesting. Why did that happen? Uh, to just continue to dig into things. Uh, the second one, um, the outsider perspective was really kind of fascinating for me because I've always, I went to this kind of Friday Night Lights high school and I was never in football and, you know, I was a snowboarder and was in bands. And so I, I kind of felt like the outsider, uh, but always wanted to be the insider. But over time, as I've, as I've looked at kind of the research, when you see like how people from the outside have thought so much differently than other folks. Um, especially when you look at people that are cross-cultural, that were raised in one country, they move to another, they then join a business. Their ability to see things completely different um, is such a superpower for them. Uh, and so to be able to go through the assessment and say, well, do I naturally have sort of an outsider perspective um, or do I need to develop that? Uh, and then we also look at um, do you have kind of the habits and the actions that will support that? Because some people may have the inclination, but you may not be doing anything with it. And, and so uh, there was this really interesting study that uh, I cite in the book where it was called the color study, and they brought together groups of six or eight people. Uh, and they would say, is this blue or is this green? And, you know, the group would say, oh, that's definitely blue, that's green. And there's some that were kind of in the middle. Sometimes people would disagree, but not for the most part. But then with the second version of the study, they brought in two people that were part of the research team. Um, and with some of those middle colors, when it was pretty clear it was a blue or pretty clear it was a green, they would say the opposite. And statistically, they had undue influence over that group as an outsider um, that would speak up against what the, the dominant kind of narrative was. And, and so oftentimes, you know, we think, I'm an outsider, I'm new to this team, or maybe you came from a different industry and you come in. Uh, you actually have more power than you even understand that you have. Um, and those that are within that, if you can recognize, wow, like I really am an insider here. I've been part of this institution for 20 years. I know all the lingo. I probably need to do things to make sure that I can still have that outsider perspective. You know, we hear out of the box thinking, but really we want to have outsider thinking. We want to say, well, someone coming new into here, what would be weird for them coming in? You know, I remember when I started a job at a community college, um, there were so many acronyms for like even they're, they're, they had this annual plan um, that every department had to do and it was called the A3 plan and I was like well, why is it called the A3? I thought it would be like there's three A's that it stood for academics or something. You know, it was the size of the paper. Like, they, <laughs> like, like, they called it the A3 plan because that's the size paper they printed it on and it was like what? Like that's just silly. Uh, but there's always those things within kind of the culture of a company 
that when an outsider comes in, they say, that's super weird. Um, and if we can step out enough to really say like, what's super weird here in our company? Like, and then do we need to shed some of that? Do we need to evaluate that? Do we need to make connections in a different way than we have? Um, that's where really having that outsider perspective can be powerful. And then the, th the third one um, is all around the ability to move on it. Uh, and so often I think high achievers like you and I get paralyzed by perfection. We wanna do it right, we think there's a way to do it, um, and that just slows us down so much. And so if we think about kind of a spectrum, on one side we have accuracy, and on the other side we have speed, there's definitely things that we want to be accurate. Um, you know, if I go under the knife at, you know, in a surgery, like that doctor, she can take as long as she needs to <laughs> take to be accurate. Yeah. Do it exactly right. Um, and, and there's lots of things in the world we want to be 100% right 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, safety protocols, all sorts of things like that. But for most people that are in the business world, that you know, when you're looking at your life, when you're even looking at how you run your family, usually speed over accuracy uh, is more important, say 70% of the time. Uh, because you can adjust and change as you go um, instead of just spend all this time getting something done. It's funny. I think that a lot of us um, in our lives bought into that Yoda phrase, do or do not, there is no try. Yeah. But you're saying, though, go ahead, try. And thank God, you know, the weight of the world isn't on our shoulders or like right. the lactic experience. <laughs> yeah. We take ourselves a little too seriously. <laughs> exactly. It's okay to try a little bit. <laughs>